How do we record accrued revenue? So let's take an example. We've invested $10,000 in a term deposit and it's going to earn 12% for a whole year. The investment occurs on the 1st of Jan. We're going to get the actual money or the interest on the 31st of December that we call that the maturity date. Um, but our balance sheet for this business is the 30th of June. So by balance day, we're going to have earned some interest but not have received it. So exactly how much? We've invested $10,000. We're going to earn 12%, so that'll be $1,200 in a year. Let's divide that by the number of months, which is 12, and we're going to earn $100 per month for the whole year. So firstly, we've got $100 of interest being earned every month during that year. But on balance day, the problem is we have earned $600 worth of uh, interest, but we haven't received it yet. So we're not going to get that until the end of December. So whilst we have um, earned it, we haven't got it, well, should we still record it? Should we still recognize it as revenue? And obviously the answer is yes, because we use accrual accounting where we uh, recognize revenue when it's been earned and not when it's been received. So how would we do that? Well, we're going to have to call this $600 interest two things. Firstly, it's an asset, and we're going to call that accrued interest revenue. It is an asset because there's a resource which we control. The interest is owed to us. It's a promise to get interest from the bank. That's something that we control. There's a past event. The funds are in, uh, invested at the start of the year. And there'll be a future inflow of economic benefits. In this case, we will receive $600 cash. But it is also a revenue. Why is it a revenue? It's because there's an inflow of economic benefits. That is the interest we have earned. Even though we haven't received it, we have an inflow of economic benefits because we have been earned it and been promised that we're going to get it. Now, revenue must either increase assets or decrease liabilities. This will increase an asset, and the asset that's going to increase is called accrued interest revenue, which is the name we said is the name of this asset here. And lastly, a revenue must have an overall impact of increasing owner's equity. So how would we record this? Well, because we've earned it but haven't received it, we don't have a journal for it. None of our special journals will do. So we're going to record this in the general journal. So what we'll say is we've got an asset called accrued interest revenue. So we are owed that money. And almost like a debtor, a debtor would go up as a debit in an asset account. Well, this is kind of similar, except for it's not for a sale. But, uh, the other effect is we've earned some revenue, so we'll do a credit into the interest revenue account. Eventually what will happen is, at the end of the year, we're going to get $1,200 of interest. And it's going to be made up of two amounts, really. It's going to be $600 of accrued interest from last period. And now that we're in the new period, there's going to be $600 of interest earned this period that is also received. So they're kind of two separate amounts. So now that we've got the money, the money can be entered, or this transaction can be entered in the cash receipts journal. We'll put the date. We'll put the receipt number or possibly bank statement if it's interest. We'll put the total amount of $1,200. And then what we're going to do is split it up in two parts. We're going to have the accrued interest we got from last period. That'll be $600. And then we'll have the interest revenue from the current period, which will also be $600. So what we want to do is we only want to have one number in the bank column of $1,200. What we don't want to do is have that split over two lines for $600 each. And it's kind of similar back in Unit 3 when we did accrued expenses and they were paid. We are going to just have the one number of $1,200. And the reason is, in the cash at bank ledger, there'd only be one entry. And so we only want to put one uh, number in the bank column. But it's very important we do split the details and the sundry entry there over two lines. What would this look like in the ledgers? Well, I've got $1,200 cash. So cash would go up. That's a debit. Accrued interest revenue, that is an asset. It's almost like a debtor. If I had a debtor who owed me $600, that would be their ledger. And when they pay me back, I would credit their account like that. Well, this is the same. Now that I've actually got that interest, it's going to decrease the accrued interest revenue asset. And that will now balance to zero because I'm not owed the money anymore. Then we've got the interest from the current period. That's just regular revenue. So we'll post that as a credit. And we've got the one debit going to the two credits there. What about if we change something, um, have the exact same case study, but at the end of the year, we not only get our interest back, 
We're also going to get, so sorry, we'll get the $600 of accrued interest. We'll get the $600 of interest from this period. But what about if we also got our $10,000 investment back? Sometimes the bank will give back our investment as well. What we're going to do is add another line into our cash receipts journal. We'll put in the receipt number and in bank this time we'll put 11,200. So first item that actually comes back is investment, is in the name of the asset. So we've now got that back. So we don't have that asset account anymore. So we better put that in sundries for $10,000. Now the rest will be the same. We'll have accrued interest revenue of 600 on one line and interest revenue on another line from the current period. What's important though is again, we just had one number in the bank column of 11,200 and that was split up over three lines with the investment, the accrued interest revenue and the interest revenue all being received.